Good evening, everyone. Well, what started out to be a bright and sunny day, I guess we have to take a little bit of responsibility for the fact that the skies turned gray, Michael. This is in your honor. The heavens are watching your debut show at the Wexner Center for the Arts and trying to just kind of get into the color scheme of things. So, um, welcome. This is um, the midpoint in a year at the Wexner Center in which every one of the artists featured in our galleries um, is a woman. And I can't say, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, you know, as I'm thinking back now, I'm not even sure that any one or another person can take credit for that, as if there's really credit to be taken. But um, I do think we all feel damn good about it. And um, we have even had a little bit of fun uh, in terms of marketing, um, thinking about, okay, so how do, we, how do we set this up and try and convey it with, um, you know, a little bit of levity. And um, people were brainstorming different ideas, but when uh, the, the notion, which I will take responsibility for, not a very smart one, came up, wall-to-wall -wall women, somebody kind of frowned and said, sort of sounds like Mitt Romney's binders full of women. <laughs> so we decided maybe that wasn't quite such a good idea. But in any event, um, this is really a celebration. It is Michael Goodson's first exhibition organized for the Wexner Center. Since <laughs> since joining us uh, less than a year ago, I think. Yeah, lost track. Um, and I, I hope you've had a chance to wander through the galleries, but if not, certainly after the exhibition, I think um, what you'll find, certainly I, I hope what you'll find is an array of extraordinary work by extraordinary women artists, um, varied, varied um, really kind of dramatically in terms of age and life experience, in terms of artistic practice and point in their, in their career trajectory, um, in terms of race, in terms of nationality. And actually that latter point I think is um, especially of note in times when the very possibility of immigration seems to be ever more contested. Um, in this show alone, we have artists who were born in Great Britain, South Africa, Ethiopia, Australia, Argentina, Lebanon, Israel, Canada, and the United States, but now variously living on multiple continents and in cities from Los Angeles to Amsterdam, London to Tel Aviv, uh, Berlin to Brooklyn. Uh, so clearly, the creative community thrives on that degree of porosity and exchange, and it's something that we here at the WEX believe in. Um, I think you'll also notice in the show that whether you call it gray or achromatic or neutral or black and white and everything in between, um, the work that has been confined to this um, somewhat so-called limited palette is anything um, but neutral or limited in its way. Um, the works range from really elaborate and quite sumptuous to, to restrained, from cosmic in, in um, consideration to almost quotidian and, and domestic, um, from sublime um, to utterly devastating. And, um, it's actually been a real joy to watch it all come together, to um, watch Michael make his way through artist studios and galleries and museums um, to bring all of this together under our, our crazy Wexner Center roof. But um, he's done a brilliant job of it, um, aided and abetted as always by a fantastic exhibitions team. Uh, Megan Cavanaugh, our Director of Exhibition Administration, 
and Dave Dickus heading up the exhibition design um, team uh, to install the show and all of their colleagues, not to mention so many other colleagues across the Wexner Center. So I'd like to thank all of them as well. Um, let me, though, ask that those artists, and I think we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the 37 artists are here with us this evening. And I would like them to each stand and stay stand it, stay standing, um, as I mention their names. Uh, Giselle Camargo. Giselle, where are you? OK, Giselle's hiding and being shy. Some of you, hmm? She's on the way. Oh. Um, Giselle, some of you might remember from our show three years ago, Cruzamentus. Um, she hails from Rio de Janeiro and um, has done some new work to augment an existing piece that you will see in our galleries. Um, Bethany Collins, someone who is new to the Wexner Center. Bethany, welcome. Delighted to have you here. Michelle Grabner, who has actually been at the WEX before. Michelle, are, are you here? Well, we'll let her know that she was cited. Um, Josephine Halverson, Josephine. Gosh, I thought I was just preternaturally late, but artists have me beat. Uh, Laura Lisbon, Laura, Laura, come on. <laughs> Laura, the professor, the person who has to stand up in front of audiences all the time. Well, uh, I think many of you in the audience know Laura. She has lived and worked in Columbus for a very long time. But what some of you may not know is that many years ago, I want to say it's at least 20 years ago now. Ben, maybe you can help me remember. Um, we did an exhibition here. Um, with Laura Lisbon that paired uh, Laura with, oh my God, I can see the work and her name just went out of my head. This is really embarrassing. I shouldn't have done that without making a note. Anyway, it was a beautiful show and I'm sure tonight at three in the morning I'll wake up and Claudia Matsko, that was it. <sighs> okay, okay, whoever is taping this needs to edit it. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, Arlene Chiquette. Arlene, are you here? Hello, welcome. <laughs> I had the, um, the real joy of being in Chicago for 48 hours a few weeks back and um, hadn't really paid that much attention to what was opening at different galleries, but was delighted when I made my way over to uh, Corbett and Dempsey and found that that very evening uh, a show of Arlene's would be opening. And I have to confess, um, much to the chagrin of the staff back here, there was one piece in that show that I actually wanted to bring back here to put on view, but I was, um, I was kind of discouraged from destroying their show and making everyone's life here crazy. Um, Beautiful show, though. Uh, Xaviera Simmons, come on. <laughs> this is a woman. <laughs> this is a woman who literally is standing all the time making her art, often on a scaffolding, as you will see. Uh, it's really an extraordinary piece. And Carmen Winant. Why, is it why not? Why not? Why not? Sorry, Carmen, um, who hails from here in, in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and this is her first time exhibiting here at the Wexner Center. Let me also just quickly thank so many of the folks out there in the world, from uh, gallerists to lenders, um, to fellow travelers and um, colleagues and peers from across the country and beyond. Um, galleries like James Cohen, Richard Gray, Corbett V. Dempsey, Frederick Freiser, uh, Peter Freeman, Hauser and Wirth, Sikama Jenkins, Team Gallery, David Zwerner. 
Um, it's been quite a while since the WEX has organized a group show, and I have to say, Michael has been a wrangler of rare pers pers persistence and perspicacity. So let me also thank um, lenders who are here this evening who don't happen to run galleries, uh, Nancy and Dave Gill and um, Noel uh, Kleiman. And finally, a thanks to our um, sponsors of the exhibition, Paige and Mike Crane and Neil Rector. Um, with that, um, let me just make one final comment because I can't resist, and that is that while the work in the show is all made by women, men do occasionally make an appearance in it. None perhaps more powerfully or poignantly at this moment um, than our very own 16th president of the United States who presides over our cafe in a piece created by Joyce Pensato uh, reminding all of us what true leadership can be. So with that, Michael. Hello. Um, Sherry did this great thing uh, that allows me not to have to uh, pronounce and or mispronounce all of those names that she just uh, uh, said. So um, uh, thank you for that. Um, we have here tonight uh, Carmen Winant, uh, Zyveria Simmons, and Bethany Collins to talk about a thing uh, that um, it kind of is, I've noticed, other than the formal matrix of the show, kind of recurrent in the show, which is women addressing uh, the idea of, uh, of history. Uh, often, as is the title of this talk, Covert Histories, which is to say under-considered histories. Sometimes not, though. Um, uh, and it, it, it's recurrent throughout the show. Mona Hatoum's work deals with uh, Cartesian systems in the building of Mexico City. Um, uh, on a cosmological level, Katie Patterson's work deals with uh, man's perception of the history of the universe. Uh, history is this recurrent idea in the show. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that as opposed to the formal matrix of the show. But before I did that, I, there are some other people that I wanted to thank uh, in terms of the just the production of this, uh, of this exhibition. Uh, specifically, uh, Nick Stull and James Miracle, who are the two uh, full-time preparators here as well, did a great job. And then I really must, it is my tradition to thank the preparators because I really do think that they make the thing run. Um, and they were great. They really worked very diligently and they have worked diligently for the three shows I've seen installed here. They really work their asses off, and I really I would like to thank them if I could. Um, uh, there are in fact three Jakes, which I think is a Mickey Spillane novel, okay. if I'm not mistaken. Jake Colson, Jake Hollier, uh, Jake Mason Macklin, uh, Nick Boso, James McDevick Strendy, uh, Ben Mowen, uh, jo Josh Culberson, uh, Nick Rusciuto. Uh, Scott Short and Adam Hernandez. They really made this show happen, along with um, also, and this is really crucial, uh, Lucy Zimmerman, who is a curatorial assistant here, Marissa Espy, also a curatorial assistant here. They did a ton of work that is essentially erased labor in this context. You, you wouldn't know it to look at the show, but they worked for months on and sweated every detail of this. Um, and reined me in, because I'm, uh, I can be um, uh, a little flighty, <laughs> which may be apparent. Uh, also, Kim Coleman, our head registrar, and Allison Banger, who is the assistant registrar here. Again, enormous amounts of labor. Thank everyone, thank you. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to start, basically this is, this is the way I'm going to run this thing, <laughs> if, if you will. Uh, I'm just going to basically ask a question that is of interest to me to each one of these things, each one of these artists, and then we're going to go through uh, their work in terms of slides and just have them talk a little bit about it in terms of 
uh, the, the context of this talk, which is again, artists addressing this idea of, of history. Um, uh, all three of you do that kind of very pointedly and kind of blithely too, I think. It's, it seems like it's part of your innate vocabulary to me. Um, and uh, I'll start with you, Carmen, if I could. Uh, and I'll start with actually a question that stems from an iteration of this work that did not actually appear in the show. Because the work went through a, a couple changes, um, one of which dealt with uh, actual images culled from the pages of, as opposed to copied images, of two uh, seminal volumes, I would say, uh, both from uh, the early to mid 70s, in terms of the second generation of the women's movement. One of which is kind of widely known, Our Bodies Ourselves, and the other one less so, uh, Our Right to Love, which is sort of a lesbian handbook. Um, and what was interesting about that, and really, uh, aside from this talk that I organized with uh, uh, Danielle Julian Norton at CCAD a couple years ago that Sharon Hayes gave, about that meeting uh, in the 70s of the global meeting of women that was supposed to culminate in the NRA but never did. ERA. ERA, I'm sorry, oh, God, no. Uh, um, uh, the ERA but never, thank you. Uh, we, know, we know what's on my mind. Um, uh, but, but, uh, along with that, kind of that talk, which is I've kept in my, as a point of purchase, if you will, for the last few years, um, uh, your initial description of that piece was really triggered this talk for me, if you will, because there was this moment that actually kind of gave me a chill uh, in that you wanted to deal with images that had actually been consumed potentially by your mother. Um, these were pages that she would have leafed through and in a very haptic way even touched and would have been affected as a whole portion of the culture was affected by um, those books. What we have actually is, a, is a, um, a different kind of work in the show, but the image, the, image, the single image repeated, I don't know how many times, about 4,000 4, times is from uh, Our Right to Love. And, um, uh, but I wanted to talk with you about uh, how, essentially how images work for you. <laughs> How's that for a broad? Uh, um, well, maybe I can start with this question of um, tapping into histories that we may or may not belong to, sort of working out from there. Um, as you say, I'm, I'm really interested in, sort of, if not obsessed with, turning to second wave feminism um, as a kind of history that's otherwise foreclosed to me. Um, we live in a moment, um, I would imagine most people in this room would agree, um, in which feminism has taken sort of on a decidedly different um, strategy um, that's virtually sort of unrecognizable to the feminism of my mother, as you say. Um, so it feels as though um, it's only there for me if I go to actively seek it out. And um, you're right that um, there, is, there is sort of an immense amount of material to seek out. I mean, printed material, ephemera, that was produced um, strategically by feminist movements, by separatist groups, um, that you know is really floating in the world and there to access. Um, so I've long been interested in kind of seeking out the image as a kind of like quote unquote primary objects object. I mean, there's something that's totally oxymoronic about that. A photograph can never really be an original, um, but um, there's something sort of powerful for me for a long time about, as you say, sort of finding the thing that my, my mother or her sort of radical feminist friends could have sort of produced or touched or distributed. That felt really important for me, particularly in a moment in which um, we have Google images and you can infinitely scroll and, and pictures um, are kind of rendered meaningless, if, if not bottomless. Um, that, that images could have a kind of life and could occupy a kind of objectness. Um, so it was a departure for me, <laughs> a major departure. Uh, this is the first time that I've not worked with primary images sort of as I think about them um, and instead decided to reproduce 
the same image over and over about 4,200 times and hand cut each image. Um, and this, the stakes for me are shifting. I mean, this is sort of like a peculiar moment to be talking about it in public because I'm trying to figure out just in what ways they're shifting. Um, but I'm certain that, um, that the, the, the power of labor is still, you know, that the work sort of insists on its own labor and it insists on its own repetition um, and it sort of insists on, on the hand kind of making the same gesture over and over. It's just kind of relocating where that labor is. Um, and frankly, it's sort of a relief to let go of the idea that the image has to be like original every time um, and it's kind of freeing me up for new possibilities. Um, but there's still a like, decidedly haptic nature to the way you're treating the image. There was a piece that uh, you had shown in a talk that I saw a couple years ago. That was the, basically, there were two images of uh, Linda Lovelace that you had during the uh, duration of Deep Throat uh, fondled to the point of uh, uh, basically destroying the image. Um, and while those were actually probably uh, originally sourced images, the haptic nature of that piece and the haptic nature of this, I see a definitive connectivity between. Yeah, absolutely. I spent, I, this is gonna be a sort of a strange sentence to say out loud, but I spent a long time touching images <laughs> um, as I was sort of trying to figure out how to intervene inside of them um, and on top of them and to sort of make my imprint and sort of literally bring myself closer to an experience that I myself have not had. Um, and yeah, the pieces that you describe, it's exactly right. I, I, I sort of touched each one uh, with the idea that the sort of, uh, it could act as almost an embrace between me and um, this person who I uh, will never know. Um, and in so doing, the sort of loving touch kind of erases or destroys her. Um, so I've, I've sort of long been trying to figure out ways, successfully and unsuccessfully, of sort of how to engage the image as a, as a real thing, as, as an object, and as a kind of, um, not only that, but as a kind of surrogate um, for a person and, and a lived experience. Um, so it, it'll be a clumsy segue, because, I, but I do think that the idea, um, of the connection between the, the work that you make and the work you make, Siberia, is really about, uh, among other things, about the hand, especially the work that you've made for this show, which is um, not so different formally than the work that you made for a recent show at the Prez in Miami, and uh, for a work that was it at the at MoMA that uh, Klaus Wiesenbach uh, commissioned. Um, the difference being, and the hairpin turn, I would argue, being for this work is the specificity of it. So the work at the Perez was really um, work rendered in three languages. It was a language work, uh, to give you an idea, this sort of uh, tidal wave of language, if you will. Um, but in, at the Perez, it was specifically about the ocean and rendered in three languages. Is that, was that correct? Or um, uh, Actually, the work at the Perez was uh, the migrants' oh, right. view yeah. from the ocean, and if you, it, it, I was basically trying to imagine if you were in mid-migration and you were trilingual, uh, languages that are kind of close to Miami, which is Haitian Creole, uh, Spanish, and English, um, what your views would be like from leaving to, uh, leaving one space and going towards another, like, Anything, when you think of despair or anguish or uh, despair, cir despairing circumstances, I, I think uh, oftentimes we forget that there's, you know, in certain moments there's also some beauty that uh, happens because your brain doesn't stop totally observing a total situation. So that's what that piece was about. But there was a, um, because of the, the three languages and the kind of the enormity of the idea, to have the idea kind of shrink down to the specificity of um, this legislation that, uh, that uh, Representative John Conyers has for 25 years tried to pass into law dealing with reparations for slavery was, that was a really interesting uh, pivot for me. And, um, and I was a little leery of it because I was, it was so much of commissioning the work for the show was predicated on the idea of the enormity of that work mm -hmm. 
at the press with the physical enormity and the enormity of the idea. As it turns out, it's this is one of the more moving moments in the show for me, um, especially the juxtaposition with your work, Bethany, because uh, if, have you been through the show at this point? Yes. Yeah, they're, they're, the two ideas are juxtaposed. And, um, but I wanted you to talk a little bit about John Conyers and this idea and the idea of placing the word rupture within this work, if, if you could, please. Um, so traditionally when I make my text-based works or most any work, um, I sketch every I sketch the work and I, with the text-based, Based works. There usually there's a lot of poetics that go into it. A lot of repetition. There's a lot of. I basically think of the text-based works as um, films or compositions, musical compositions. I kind of hear uh, images rather than uh, kind of see them in a way. So when I sit to write a text-based work, it's kind of for me like I'm making a score. Um, so uh, that. That I usually I've worked like that until this this project, um, and I think I had to become more concrete because I feel more concrete, and that has to do with where we are in the country right now. I have I'm an artist. I I have friends from every walk of life, and I am so deeply. Um, I'm I'm always almost brought to tears when I talk about this, but I'm so deeply concerned by uh, the climate that we um, have found ourselves in. And I actually thought we had moved uh, f in a future direction. And now I see, uh, you know, there's been like a mask that's um, kind of been torn off of our society from my perspective and my community's perspective, which is very diverse, um, culturally, sexually, every kind of way. So I kind of needed to be more concrete and I will say to amend what I just said, I've, I've, this is part of my biography, I've spent uh, two years in walking pilgrimage with monks, right? So retracing parts of the transatlantic slave trade. So I've really walked a lot of this landscape in America, the Caribbean, and Africa. And to see where we are, um, especially, uh, white America and black America and Latin, <laughs> you know what I mean? To really see where we are and to see the disparity is something that I really feel like I have to be very uh, upfront about how I feel. And so that led me to meditating on um, Conyers' uh, HR 40, his, his reparations um, proposal, which is not actually a proposal for reparations, it's a proposal for the United States government to discuss the idea, <laughs> to study an idea. And this man from Detroit has been doing, has been putting forth the same bill every year for 25 years. And it's the foundation of our country, slavery here, and, and white supremacy. And we have to, I just, there's, there's no poetics, I just had to be up front. Um, and what about the word rupture in, in that context? So then that's where the word rupture comes in because I also have to be truthful to my practice, right? And I actually do like to compose. So I couldn't just take this bill and take it for its face value. I had to think about, well, what am I trying to say by meditating on this. And for me, there's a few different ruptures. Um, in the piece, I start off with the definition of rupture, which is kind of like my, the, the poetics that I traditionally work in or the film cinematic that I work in with the text pieces. But then I go into the bill and instead of, in his bill, um, it's a formal bill. So he says this act, which um, the act is the name of the bill. Um, I just call it this rupture because um, the first rupture is, you know, was slavery here? Uh, and for me, the second, and then there's all these little ruptures, incarceration, redlining, Jim Crow, <laughs> lynching, um, uh, and about white supremacy, all kinds of things. Um, and then the rupture that I'm trying to think about is how do we rupture past all of that and get into a conversation where we at least begin to study this history so that we can, um, as a collective community of individuals, move forward um, in our conversation. So rupture is sort of violent, um, but it's been a violent history that we're standing here on right now. 
Um, and as I said in the show, that is juxtaposed uh, with uh, your work, uh, Pattern of Practice, and um, uh, which basically takes the Department of Justice, uh, the language from the Department of Justice report on Fergus, the Ferguson Police Department, and renders it in a blind embossed text on white paper. There's a kind of redaction in both works, quite honestly, because Conyers' bill is sort of obscured by the way it's rendered and by the scale at which it's rendered. Um, it is sort of a tidal wave of language, but oddly unreadable, and yours uh, right next to it is also kind of through process redacted. And it, it, I, it's, it's almost a little heavy handed and a little didactic, but I couldn't help it. I thought that they belonged together. And uh, I'll, I'll defend that. Uh, um, and, uh, but I wanted you to talk a little bit about that work and also about the Southern Review work, which also deals with redaction. Um, uh, and you know, specifically to me, the most moving part for me was the, the redaction of, uh, of Melvin Dixon's uh, language because he was dealing not only with uh, being perceived as the other in terms of race, but also being perceived as the other as a gay man. And um, to redact his language is, uh, is, a, powerful, is a powerful gesture. And, um, but I wanted you to talk a little bit about both pieces in the show, if, if you could. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll do Southern Review first. Is mine on? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm originally from Alabama. I moved, yeah. I moved to uh, New York for a residency at the Studio Museum at right about the time that Thomas Lacks had a show about Southern artists. I think it was like the stars, stars. Where the stars fall, begin to fall. Yes. Which was a really, yes. really great show. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful show. And so people were coming through that, that show and then uh, our studios were upstairs on the third floor. So they were coming through the show and then coming up to the studio. I think most of the people I was having visits with had done some research into my biography. And so they knew I was from Alabama. And so the question I was getting over and over again was, how does it, how does it, how does it feel to be a Southern artist living in New York? What does that feel like to be from Alabama? And it was said with a particular tone, yeah? Um, that I picked up on, right? And it's all about, it, it was more about Alabama and a curiosity about that and how I got to New York. Like, how did I get myself to New York from that place? Um, and I'm not a good, like, first responder. The first time I hear a question that I'm not prepared for, like this, uh, <laughs> it takes me, the second time I will answer it beautifully. But I'll, the I'll ask you this question again in 30 <laughs> no, seconds. It'd be so good. Um, it takes me a minute, and so I, I've never called myself Southern. I will say that my work is rooted in the history of the South. It comes from that place. When I go back home to Alabama, I just came home from Alabama, my work feels re-centered, right? It's like, it is rooted there. But I've never called myself Southern because uh, Southern to me connotes, like you say it, and I image immediately a white male body. And my body does not fit within that image. Um, Southern. And so I found this Southern Review Journal in a little bookstore in Atlanta when I was still in residence. Uh, and I started to rip out the pages, kind of picking the titles that felt more evocative and provocative and could potentially tell a different story about what it meant to be Southern, my story. And then I also started to fill in the body of the pages text, but only the body. So titles get to stay, authors get to stay, footnotes, captions, uh, even page numbers, nothing is touched by my hand except that body, right, the block of text. That then was my way of thinking, all right, well, if, if my body does not fit within what it means to be Southern, I will change the narrative of what it means to be Southern. I will rewrite literally that body. The first couple pages that I did were super clean. Like the, the lines were really crisp. Can we show that detail image? And then I really, you know, so I was it's made with a super, super soft, velvety charcoal that like by the time you're done with it, rubbing, rubbing, rubbing that charcoal into the body of the text, it's like soot, it's everywhere. And so I was throwing away those pages that got messy and out of bounds of the body and then I realized that was the good stuff because that was my hand in rewriting literally that narrative. That's the, that's the series as a whole. I think this piece that's in the show is a special edition like in and of itself. It's also special uh, within my practice. So in 1985, the Southern Review had an editor change. And the editor's note at the beginning of the journal, it's a quarterly issue still being published since the 30s, small break for World War II. It's a prestigious journal. Uh, in 85, the editor's note at the beginning says, 
a little bit more eloquently than this. We haven't had a lot of black authors up until now. Oops, here they all are at once. Done. Right? It's like their corrective edition. And so it was, I mean, on the one, so here I broke my rule. So if the rule is I fill in the body within my practice, I stick to the rule that I have made, the system that I have made in order to ascertain new meaning. But the rule there, I mean, it felt like that issue was already doing what I had set out to do. And so there was a lot of language that I could not touch. There was like no need to touch. I tried, and so I would block in or fill in, I think. Uh, and then I would have to pull myself back. And it was a constant, I mean, I think what you're mentioning is a constant kind of tension of like trying to follow my own rules arbitrarily uh, and failing. I don't know what that means for my practice. It still makes me really uncomfortable. The piece makes me uncomfortable because it doesn't follow the rules, but it is what it is. But it has a, it, there's a corporeal element to both works, mm -hmm. um, both in terms of process, in terms of scale, actually. Mm -hmm. And I knew that immediately when I stood in front of this work uh, unframed in your yeah. studio, which honestly was kind of the more uh, um, uh, effective version of the work for me without this patina of glazing between it because you could really... Uh, get a sense of the, the depth of that black and the haptic nature of your fingerprints all over yeah. those pages, the breaking of the rules, if you, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but there's something also about the body in, uh, um, it's not just an ocular event, uh, um, the, the blind embossed work. Mm -hmm. it, it's, there's something about it that is scaled to the human body, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, and I, how does, the, first of all, does that work follow the rules more say, than uh, Southern Review? Yes and no. You, interestingly, you picked the two works that make me really uncomfortable. Good. I, yeah. I'm glad Thanks. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, so a pattern or practice is a blind emboss of almost all of the DOJ report on Ferguson, so the Department of Justice report on the Ferguson Police Department that came out in 2015. Um, it's a blind embossing of all the pages except the conclusion, so almost all. It makes me, well, let me talk about the piece first, then I'll tell you why it makes me uncomfortable. Um, when the Ferguson report came out, I remember reading, it was an NPR report, and it was a professor out of St. Louis who said reading that report was like being told that water was wet. Yeah. Um, it's like, of course it is, but if we're denying it for a really long time, like just that is enough. Like just the truth in a document, the possibility of that is tantalizing. And going back to something you said, Siberia, it's, it's a painful document and it's a horrific document, but it's also a really beautiful document in the way that it truth tells. Mm -hmm. It's like all the reasons in 104 pages mm -hmm. leading up to an event. It's like, I'm 32. Here's all the reasons for how I got here. Yeah. That possibility is beautiful. I think because it takes you out of the loop. Yeah. At least that's what I've realized. You know, I'm like, I'm out of stop. This, this is it. I know this is it. You know what I mean? That, yes, there's more, but like in terms of the culture here in our America, it's really one of the biggest things we have. This is how the country was built. This is how people accumulated wealth for my, with my work is, is through land ownership. And blacks were systematically denied land ownership rights for hundreds of years. So it's, you, get to, you get out of stop. And then you got to figure it, you know, you got to get, I have to get out of it. Mm. It's, I, I feel the same way. Mm. I'm very uncomfortable with the work, but I know it's the truth because we have scholars who've thought about this for hundreds of years. Mm. Oh, I was going to follow up and I lost oh, that. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> this is a detail of the work to give you an idea of actually how it operates. And actually it's photographed in a way that, uh, where the language is actually less obliterated than I think it is when I saw it both in your studio and on the wall here. It's sort of beautifully photographed to give that shadow. But um, it, it's amazing how the language disappears. Um, so the blind embossed then is, um, 
so I engrave the text backwards into plates, into plexi plates, and then soak paper so that it becomes malleable. And then place the soaked paper, dripping wet paper, on top of the plates and run it under this uh, tremendous amount of pressure under a, a printing press. And so the text is literally like forced into those grooves of the plate. It's forcing then that text to protrude from the surface of the paper. It's like printing nothing which is opposite, yes? It's printing literally nothing. It's the cleanest printmaking process that possible. Uh, and maybe simplest, it's super simple. And yet, I think the paper, because of the pressure it undergoes, the way that that text protrudes from the surface, almost like braille, it, it, um, it maintains the pressure it went through. Does that make sense? Like the pressure f is physically present uh, in the force. It also, I think, begs to be touched, which feels different than the Southern Review, which is like all touched. My hand is absent here, and that's the part that makes me uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. And we we actually have a we were required to put a, a stanchion in front of it because it's it it's it's such a kind of repulsive thing that's so inviting, which was another really fascinating thing. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, I wasn't exactly in tune to that, even though I, I knew it mm -hmm. until it was installed here, which is to say yesterday. <laughs> so I had this new experience with it completely installed where I was uh, uh, experiencing the repulsion and the desire simultaneously, mm -hmm. uh, which has been a little disruptive for me, quite yeah. honestly. Um, oh, good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, and it's also in a room with Amalia Pika's work that is really about uh, muting protests that um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, both, it's a, a really beautiful room that's utterly uncomfortable. Um, that's interesting. It's, it's all wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's all right, yeah. uh, so to speak. Um, so I, you know, I'd like to go through and just sort of look at some, because really I think the goal of this more than anything else is just to put the idea or the, the ideas that you work with into the public realm uh, tonight and then uh, into the future. Uh, so I just kind of want to go through some slides and have each of you talk a little bit about your work if we could as we sort of wind this down and get into the opening. Yeah, there's, I, I'd like to know uh, kind of um, what the what your thoughts are, what the process is, and really in a way that uh, it attunes everyone to how they're related. If in the context of this idea of dealing with history, which we don't do, like we we, in a, we had a Zaviria, you and I had a conversation about like, the paradigm with dealing with history is about uh, repetition. Mm -hmm. That's really what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really great and what's really sensitive about the way history is dealt with in this show is that it confronts the idea of not being repetitive, uh, of essentially um, doing that simple thing that John Conyers is trying to do, which is just bring the idea up. That's all he's asking to do. Um, anyway, so in that context. <laughs> um, um, yeah, sure. Th so this is an image from my studio, which probably speaks for itself. Um, this is actually not the first edition printing of Our Bodies Ourselves, as you can probably tell from the spine, the new Our Bodies Ourselves. So this edition was actually published in 82. Um, I guess the best way to talk about this is by saying that I spent a long time making my own pictures. Um, and was sort of like deeply and truly a photographer and slowly started to move into the world um, of imagery that wasn't my own and didn't belong to me. And it freaked me out initially um, and I was unsure if, uh, you know, a 1982 edition of Our Bodies Ourselves that I bought for 50 cents at the, you know, on the side of the road, if that, um, <laughs> if that could make up the constituent parts of my art. And if that was, um, if, you know, questions ranging from like legitimacy to what's archival, <laughs> um, how that sort of, uh, you know, ultimately affects the value of the work and so on and so forth. Um, and I decided to just disband with all of that and ultimately give up making my own pictures. Um, feeling like there was much more power um, in the pictures that I could find. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I, I felt and continue to feel like this, this history was totally foreclosed. And um, I became really interested 
in, um, in why that was and uh, the gap between, um, let's say, like Sheryl Sandberg feminism and um, bell hooks feminism or Gloria Steinem feminism um, and sort of how I could understand myself as a 33-year-old woman who grew up with, um, well, parents, but particularly a mother who was really vested in and helped innovate that kind of feminism, um, how I could investigate that through pictures and like through crappy pictures and, um, you know, pictures that were sort of fading um, and otherwise degenerating. Um, and this is, these are images from my studio wall um, as I was sort of making tests for the piece that is now in the gallery. Um, this is an image from a book from 1979 called Behind Closed Doors, A Marriage Manual. Not, not for the, the faint of heart. Um, and this is maybe a good example of the kinds of images that I'm attracted to, um, which, are, which is to say uh, ambiguous images and contradictory images, or images that hold a kind of contradictory charge. So an image like this, I gravitate towards because um, it's at once tender and violent. Um, and it's sort of impossible to tell um, if it is um, an act of aggression, even an act of rape, um, or an, like a sort of domestic uh, sex playfulness. Um, and to me, that's, that's really the charge of images, um, is, uh, is that they, can, uh, they don't do what they're supposed to do, which is objectively describe a scenario or circumstance. They, they can completely undo that. And, and I think to some extent, the image that I landed on in the gallery does that as well. It's difficult to tell um, sort of the gender necessarily of these two figures locked in embrace um, or the surrounding context. Um, so that to me, that's been the pull of images as long as I've been working with them, making them um, and then more successfully collecting them. Um, and you know, I'm still, I'm still endlessly sort of trying to um, figure out the way they can sort of um, the way they can contradict themselves and each other, the way they can sort of stand for multiple histories, the way they can sort of become surrogates for my body and the body of others. Um, and I'm interested, sort of get back to this notion of what makes me uncomfortable, um, I'm interested in, to see sort of how moving away from, um, from the original and, and towards sort of my own, uh, you know, a quality of repetition that I'm insisting upon through uh, reproduction. Um, I'm interested to see how that unfolds. Check back with me in like a I year, will, a year it, or so. Um, it's an yeah. odd kind of, I, I mean, I, I guess I would then fancy you a collector of sorts. Everyone collects something, uh, but, it remind, but collecting uh, something uh, repetitively and so specifically reminds me of, I think it's a I could be wrong. It's a Jonathan, Jonathan Franzen short story about a birder who watches only one bird. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Um, and uh, that's always fascinated with me. Fascinated me with in terms of just uh, what it means to collect and meditate on a single image. In a, yeah, in a, I mean, it's in a culture where there is an ocean of images coming at you always, all the time. It, 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 indeed, it's a sort of disease because you start to. Um, fixate on images and sort of see them everywhere and um, become obsessed with, with their sort of aggregation. And I was telling you the other day, Michael, that um, it's a relatively closed circuit if you're dealing with certain kinds of images from a certain era, from a certain decade, I start to see those images repeat in the world, <laughs> right? And it's such a like a strange feeling when we live in this moment of just the infinite, um, the, the Google search or, you know, Getty images of just like, um, woman working yields like 20 million photographs, right? So like, it's, um, it's been a very strange experience to see that world start to fold in on itself. I've been collecting images for maybe 10 years um, and I recognize and can identify um, and, and sort of contextualize images that I see out in the world um, that I've collected or used in my own studio life. Um, and it, yes, it feels um, like a sort of like a secret or a, a kind of private language to engage in. Um, so Vera, I wanted to, we have a few slides of some uh, work that's, because your work is, your practice is really interesting. It's almost like a calendar practice. Mm -hmm. So you devote certain parts of the year almost to certain uh, disparate parts of your practice, which is really fascinating to me. So I think these next few slides sort of uh, speak to that, if you could talk about the work a little bit. Sure. 
Um, so like you, I collect images um, also, but um, I use them in different ways. Um, my practice is photography, sculptural, it's film, it's choreographic now, um, installation, and, and sound. Um, and so this is a piece titled number 21. It's, it's a video still from 2015, but it originated actually looking at images of uh, a male on male gaze. So looking at uh, men in, um, in, in, in sexual and sensual conversation with other men. So that's how the piece began. I was looking at some of the peers in New York City. It was actually for a commission for the High Line. Um, uh, in New York and so I was looking at the peers and, and what made me most excited was thinking of my body looking at historical images of uh, gay men um, engaging in sensual times together and how I could um, ha find pleasure not necessarily like sexual pleasure but um, sensual visual pleasure in looking at that um, looking at these men, and also the gaze of the photographers, which were all men. So that's how this, this work originated, and I, I um, kind of choreographed a score based on the historical images of a lot of these male, I'm, I'm hesitant to use the word queer anymore, so I don't use that word anymore. Um, I find that word troubling, so I'm gonna just be very clear. It was, it was male on male, uh, uh, sensuality that I was most excited about and but I I used the gestures um, to produce a work that had all female um, bodies in in as uh, the protagonists uh, in the choreographic score so this piece first was a photographic work straightforward pho photography and then it became a choreographic work and then it became a, a full uh, theater piece um, at the kitchen this year um, this is a work titled Composition One for Score A. So I started my practice, um, I, I mentioned a brief biography about myself in that I did spend two years um, walking uh, with monks, which is, which is pretty foundational, I realized, to my practice because it um, made me be very cognizant of like this much space and what this m amount of space, like space as in air and also um, sea and also ground, what this much space could mean. Um, thinking about ancestors, thinking about history, thinking about present time, thinking about land ownership, human rights, uh, uh, lynching, death, <laughs> you know what I mean, wealth, all these kinds of things. I think it all kind of really came together doing that walking pilgrimage. And so um, this piece, I've, I spent a long time as one of the actors in my work, um, which I'm not in as much, um, but I really have, was always historically fascinated with uh, landscape painting. And I think landscape painting is probably like something we could pretty much all agree on is usually the first landscape of some sort is usually the first kind of art that you engage with at least that's what it was for me whether it be on a calendar uh, in my mother's kitchen or whether it be in an art histor history class um, landscape was the thing and so I started thinking about landscape and how to populate these landscapes, this sublime landscape mostly, uh, not usually not urban with, with a diverse body of characters. Um, and uh, this is Kitty Hawk Man, which uh, is another kind of thinking about other narratives inside of this uh, sublime landscape. Your turn. <laughs> uh, so, my work then, I'm interested in these ideas of race and identity and language. Language as a, literally the subject of the work, like the material of the work, but also as a like material and subject. So language functions um, for me as a kind of prism through which I can interrogate these other topics. I'm also though interested just like purely in language, in the capacity of language to say anything. Um, I have a sense that if I could just master language, if I could be a master of any one particular language, then there's nothing that we could not communicate about. 
And on the flip side of that, and the binary of that, I have the sense that uh, I will always, we will always fail. Actually, just that language will fail because it's an extension of us. Because we created it, it is our most like transcendent moment, and it's also the thing that is um, inherently doomed. Regardless of how miraculous language is, yeah. it's connected to us. Yeah. What luck. <laughs> it's not gonna work. Um, so, so that struggle, I think, is um, embodied in all of the, my, the series or the bodies of works within my practice, including this work, which is from my contronym series. So contronyms are words that contain their own opposite meanings. It's a strange little oddity of the English language. Actually, it's not. It's not central just to English. It happens in other languages as well. Uh, but I'm focusing on English at the moment. So there's about 80 contronyms within the English language. Quiddity is still my favorite contronym. Quiddity is the essence of a thing and a trifling nothing. It's like everything and it's nothing. And that feels like a way we could be talking about race and identity or 10 other things at the same time. Ravel is another really good one. Yeah. It is to complicate the thing like Christmas lights and to tangle it all up. And it is to simplify it out and make it linear and simple to understand. And somehow over time, these 80 terms have come to embody uh, and I think abide their own contradiction. So that's what's happening. What's printed here is a contronym. In this case, it's bound, B-O-U-N-D, from the 1982 dictionary. 1982 dictionary. Um, don't ask me what the definition for bound is because I'm not. I don't remember at the time, at the moment. But what's left here um, from this like erasure? So I'm printing the definition of bound twice, side by side, a kind of mirror-like effect. Uh, and then I rewrite it in graphite as a way to like think about what bound means, how it embodies its own contradiction. And then I use my spit and I erase. So what you're seeing is like slightly um, hard to read um, is actually because I've erased that top layer of the paper. And the only thing that's left legible then are these opposing either definitions or opposing uh, illustrative sentences. So for bound, the opposing illustrative sentences are the ends of the earth, the end of his rope. It's like way out there, infinitely, it's still the end, or right here, and it's still the end, right? Um, so sometimes I'm focusing on the definition, sometimes I'm focusing on uh, a way of speaking that still doesn't quite get at, I mean, it's poetic, and there's meaning there, but it never gets to like the central clarity of the thing. And this is temper. In the and same temper. Context. So lose one's temper. Sorry. Lose one's temper. Keep one's temper. They're both inherently possible. And then what falls from there as I'm using my spit to erase, the pink pearl eraser falls beneath the surface. The paper, that top layer, falls beneath the surface. Uh, and I I sweep it up into little piles and then make them into little sculptures and they keep the same title as what they came from. So this is the erasure of Bound. So it's still called Bound from 1982. I think this is important because it maintains the essence of the definition. It's the same thing. And I think if you were really dedicated and, and unrolled them all, right, and separated the eraser from the paper, you could put that definition back together. And yet in another way, you never will, right? It's like origin of the thing. Maybe you could get to it. You'll probably never get to it. So it's really not detritus for you. It's, it's still a usable yeah. product. It's residue, but there's still meaning there. <laughs> yep. It's meaningful residue. And this is... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, from the word find. From find. And this is a black magic eraser, which I just found. It's not my titles. That's a handsome pile, though. It's a funeral, right? Isn't it? Oh, your turn. Mm -hmm. this, I, this work, uh, Super Unknown, is like, uh, one of the first works I saw of yours. And um, I kind of, well, I'll let you talk about it, but I, I truly love the idea of this, of this work, which was also at the Perez. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. this was um, originally at uh, MoMA PS1. Super unknown. I was a really big Chris Cornell fan. I'm so bummed I'm so, for all our friends. And I was a really big metalhead. Just, I'm going to just put that out there. But I'm really, I'm, ha I'm struggling with Chris Cornell's what happened. Um, anyway, so this is titled Super Unknown, um, which is, um, was actually a Soundgarden uh, song, which... Um, 
And uh, this was commissioned in 2010 and um, by MoMA PS1. And I, uh, like you, was, was collecting images. I was thinking, I actually have a, a large format photography uh, practice. That's how I started making my work. Um, and I was like, I really, I don't want to be in landscapes like the previous works that I showed. I want to be in my studio. And I wanted to think of, um, there's a text that goes along with this piece that says, who collects and who migrates. And, and, and I really wanted to think about those two things, collecting and migrating, and how to bring them together. Um, and, and I did it through images. I didn't start out thinking I was going to be thinking about migratory practices, but um, those were the images that um, spoke to me in, in probably 2009 and 10. Um, is this a specific migration? This is this is a kind of um, multiple. It's an first of all, it's all images called from the internet that I then worked over and did my own process. Like Bethany, you know, I did my own kind of photographic uh, conditioning through Photoshop. But um, this is all people mid migration, either from uh, you know Haiti or the Caribbean to America, or from. Uh, Africa or Northern Africa to Europe. Um, and there may be some, one historical image from uh, Vietnam, folks migrating from Vietnam. So I, um, you know, started collecting these images and, and realized that that's, this was the thing. That was, that was, I wanted to see the in-between space, because that's kind of the practice that I had been working on in my photographs, which is characters in between spaces. And for me, with Super Unknown, this was about they're not, they're neither at their destination nor are they in their homeland. So what is that space in between? And also the photographer as witness, because as we know now with um, this work, uh, with these images, like. If there's a photographer, then there could have been, if there's a witness, <laughs> then there could have been people to save. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking a lot, or, or to aid. So I'm kind of thinking a lot about that, kind of hovering, hovering over. And then this is a practice that I've been um, doing for, I would say, seven years now. It's called the Index Composition Series. So these are basically sculptures inside of photographs. They're large-scale photographs. Um, I use uh, human figures and build the sculptures. Um, and for me, these are uh, landscapes. And I will say, because my practice is diverse, um, generally, whatever I'm working on with, let's say, a text-based work, it usually informs the photographic work, and then the photographic work usually informs the performance work or the sound work. So I try to, even though I work in different mediums, I try to bring um, one aspect of the last project into this project, hence the reason why I chose to do the piece Rupture here at the Wexner is because I have a show up at um, the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard, and I spent a year in their archives, and while I was in their archives, um, they had a uh, conference on slavery and the university, and that's how I got to thinking about reparations, was because um, Drew Faust, the head of Harvard, uh, had a conversation with ta Coates, and you know, he was just basically like, you guys are teaching this stuff to your students, like, why aren't you, you have to deal with it for real. Like, we have to start dealing with it for real. And I made a series of photographs that are up on view right now that um, have uh, reparations in the images, and that led me to the text that we have here. Uh, yeah, that discussion, we had that discussion on your initial trip about Harvard, which was also the impetus for this, one of the impetus for this talk. Uh, so thanks. You're welcome. I, and also, just in, in terms of time, I'm going to go ahead and, and take a couple questions, maybe two, three questions, and then we'll go to the opening, because really the proof is in the show, and let's go look at the show. I, I and congratulations, say. by the way. Amazing job. Thanks. Congratulations. <laughs> Are there any questions? No questions.
questions? Can I, can I, can I make someone ask a question? Yeah, you can. <laughs> Ooh, I, I am, so I'm gonna give you just two seconds to breathe, because I really am gonna do it. And you guys are so juicy looking. I won't, I won't embarrass my in-laws who are here. But I am going to ask, I have to ask you two gorgeous people right in front of me. You know who you are. I'm going to ask you, what are your questions? Because I'm obsessed. <laughs> Doesn't have to be to me, by the way. I know, but I, I can, but I can pass it along. I went like this, and <laughs> you, there's something right on the tip of your tongue, Bethany. Yeah. <laughs> no, Don't call me out. <laughs> Sorry, can I can I just ask you to clarify? So, is the is the question um, sort of how to contend with the lack of presence that you see? Um, I, yeah, you, you, go, you go. Uh, Are you an artist? I am. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm going out on much of a limb to say that, um, it, you know, you have an immense power to, you know, as is being talked about here on stage to represent and make meaningful your own experience. Not that it only falls to you, of course, and nor, nor should it, right? Um, but I think there, there's real um, strength and agency, sort of what you can put out in the world and the decisions that you make mm -hmm. as an artist and how to sort of contend with your own body and your own history, sort of through that channel. Um, again, I want to reiterate, it isn't all on one person, right? It isn't all on you or anyone else to take, to sort of shoulder that responsibility. Um, but like, what a meaningful place to start. I think it's really important though, I love that you asked that question because I think it's important to expect and demand um, allies, you know? And so for me, um, I don't know, I'm from New York. I grew up with like, fo I'm, I'm just from New York from the 70s and 80s. I'm out, I'm out there, you know? <laughs> and, um, and even, you know, even now. And so, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's just, it's all out there for me. Um, but at the same time, for my work and personally, to be an advocate, right, like for number 21, um, I, I try to be clear in the language of how I express uh, what the research was so that you, even though the, the bodies in this particular piece are all women, I try to be clear on where I got the research from. And also that piece started it became another piece which which is very much about being an advocate you know about being like it's it's not just about my perspective it's not just about me even as a black female or as an artist it's like i've got to make sure that i'm paying attention to other voices and and i do that um in my practice intentionally by making things uh sexually uh shifting, linguistically shifting, and also the practice that itself. Um, but that doesn't mean that I've been an advocate enough, I will say that, or an ally enough. There's also just the very practical notion of making the work. Like, that's, you, you want the work to be seen, uh, make the work. Uh, the time is nigh, kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, about uh, the, no advocacy can parallel just the, the actual making of the work. Uh, yeah. uh, make the work and, it'll, and put it out there. Be, f be fierce about it, yeah. I, I think 
that I would like to see art presented in places that are not in the wealthiest parts of the town. I mean, why, you know, artists aren't wealthy. Why can't the people who want to see art go where the artists are? I mean, I think this idea that we always come to some really swishy, nice place <laughs> is, is antithetical to the idea of art. That's what I'd like to see. There, there are lots of opportunities right here in Columbus for that. I would actually encourage everybody to go to uh, No Place Gallery, which is a gallery that one of our preparators runs, for instance, which is not, I will say, a nice place. Yeah. and not in a nice place and it's an incredible gallery doing incredible work you have to seek it out but I will say artists like nice things you know like we like to drink and eat well we like nice homes and we love nice hotels we like nice stuff you know why because we've spent so many years not having you know not having nice things struggling working for $150 a week and like that was it and just making and not losing our hair, our teeth, our nails. So we like nice stuff. <laughs> but, but I agree with you totally and I say hallelujah to you because you are also fabulous. Thank you. Um, so I'm really curious. I'm really curious about the diaspora aspect of your work, you know, the Alabama to New York, the walking across, you know, the Caribbean and Africa, and even the diaspora aspect of kind of feminism, you know, uh, migrating from one, uh, whether it's decade or generation to the next. Uh, diaspora, I would say, is intrinsic to the idea of history, first of all. I mean, people move around. You gotta move. Yeah. To that point, I moved to Chicago recently because it has, it feels livable like Atlanta, which is where I was for four, six years. Uh, and it feels a little bit, a little bit closer to the art scene of New York, a little closer. Um, and it's giving me both. And that feels like a career move, but also like a life move. And to your point, Chicago also feel it's got some of that southernness that I need, great migration kind of southernness, especially on the south side, especially in South Shore, just enough. And it also feels like big city. And so I'm getting a sense of home and, and else at the same time. I, I mean, I, I love that you included me in that. I don't necessarily think about, I haven't up until this point, of use that word or thought about my work in terms of diaspora, but of course one of the things that happens in diaspora is a letting go of the old for an embrace of the new, and um, there's something sort of desperately sad about that. Um, I don't know how comparable this is, but I was just re-watching Daughters of the Dust, which de deals with this, obviously, the sort of um, the sadness in letting go of the thing that you know you'll never be able to touch again, um, which maybe is a kind of common denominator for us here on stage. Um, certainly, that's something that I struggle with in my work, um, productively struggle with. I mean, I described earlier um, sort of being interested in the space between, which I'll sort of never be able to build out or understand. Um, and one of the defining characteristics now, I think, of contemporary feminism is its rejection of the old um, and a sort of determination to be, in some ways, anything but. So um, I think it's interesting to think about that in terms of diaspora um, for all that we can't take with us. I'm gonna, do you have thoughts on diaspora? And then we'll, we'll probably go look at the show. I don't have to. No, go ahead. I, oh. Uh, Diaspora. I'm trying to think of what that word means to me now. Um, I'm greedy, I guess. I, 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 um, diaspora. What, what does that word mean? Um, I, I think my, I'm, I'm, I think my practice is very migratory. Uh, so, um, in, in its structure, in its topics. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not very sloppy. I'm very, uh, sh I'm a straight shooter, but at the same time you know, I'm influenced. Like my partner, he speaks four languages fluently and I'm very influenced by that practice. Mm -hmm. um, and it's 
come into my work. And, and um, you know, but I'm also like this human being, so I, I see all these colors and people, and I'm like, whoa, like I'm, I'm, I'm like Jewish, but then I'm, also, I'm from New York, you know, and then I'm, but I'm African, right? And that, and that whole diaspora, and then the whole European diaspora is also part of me, and then a Latin certain part, and Asian, I'm very influenced because I grew up Buddhist, so I don't know, like it kind of, I feel very like free. This is going back to you. I feel very free to, to take from the diaspora of our humanity. And on that note, let's go look at the exhibition, and thanks a lot. <laughs>